So, very good to be here for the um, New Year, the South South and Southeast Asian New Year. And I should mention that it too, of course, it covers many countries apart from um, Thailand and Sri Lanka too. There are many other countries. And if people are wondering where I have been, I've been away for a month. <laughs> I've been in Sri Lanka. I had a lovely time there having a retreat, attending a retreat and also catching up with people, teaching and having five days in Thailand too to uh, meet Ajahn Ganha. So that's where I have been. And yesterday was actually the um, New Year's Day. Um, some people, how many people think today is a New Year's Day? Because 14th was, is customarily the, the uh, New Year's Day. But in, in Sri Lanka, at least, on, it was yesterday. The government uh, changed it to the 12th and 13th. It can be 13th or 14th can be the actual New, new Year Day. So is it 40, is a New Year Day in Thailand today? or Yeah? I think it was yesterday too, actually. Yeah, three, and it goes on for three days. Yeah. In, in Sri Lanka, it goes on for about a week. <laughs> I think people are having a good holiday. I'm sure in Thailand too. Probably goes on for more more days than that. So, in so this is uh, one of the um, one of the uh, major uh, holidays in the year, and it's a very heartwarming holiday for people because it's returning, isn't it, to the village, going back to where you were born, your home, where all your family is established, and so this is quite sort of like an important. Uh, event in the year. The International New Year, I don't know about Thailand, but in Sri Lanka it's, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's not the main thing really. Because when you go back to the village, it's like going back to your roots, isn't it? Going back to where you started from, where you were brought up. And that sense of home or a sense of place where you belong is quite, quite strong in, uh, I think, in Sri Lanka for sure and in Thailand. Whereas in the West we tend to, home is where we hang our hat, <laughs> it's anywhere. We don't have that strong sense of uh, where we came from. And that's something that can be very useful actually for people, for stability in their lives. And, and I know in Sri Lanka many people tend to, they may work anywhere, but they actually come back to the village very regularly where they live. And um, so it's very important psychologically and as well as in terms of society too, because you have that, you know, the coming together of people in the village that may not live there a lot of the year, but they'll come back for the new year. So there's that sense of community and harmony, and as I say, the sense of our roots, where we came from. So this is great. And of course, the new year wouldn't be complete without a new year greeting, so I can say it in Sinla, I'll say it badly in Thai, and I think Ajahn... Ajahn Sadaru can say it very well in Thai, which is Suba Alut Awurudak Veba. That's Sinhala, which just means Happy New Year for everyone here that's uh, uh, from a Sri Lankan background. And for, for Thai, listen to this one, Ajahn. <laughs> Suk San Wan Bipi Mai Thai. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> Did that sound like any? It probably, I know if you don't get the tones right, it can be in terrible meaning. <laughs> So, Ajahn, would you like to... Here we are. That was a bit, that was a bit different. I saw it on. Very good. Kwam <laughs> Suk. That's lovely. Suk Sabai. It does. It does sound. Sounds a bit more authentic, doesn't it? <laughs> That's great. So, and also... We've had three New Year's this year, so the uh, the one on the 31st of December, sometimes call it international, then the Lunar New Year, and now the uh, South or Southeast Asian New Year. So if the other two haven't been good for you, you can take this one, <laughs> because New Year is all about starting, new starts, isn't it? Because the, you often wonder, what is the big attraction for having New Year's? Every culture seems to have a new year, doesn't it? And uh, so it's, it's very much associated with new beginnings. When the harvest is finished, that's a big thing in Sri Lanka. Um, and I'd, in Thailand probably too, the harvest is over. And also sometimes connected with the solar, uh, the solar cycle. So for the 31st of December, isn't it? 
we are having the uh, with the days are getting longer after the uh, the winter solstice. So, so it's uh, and it's also the important thing about a new year too is not only looking forward to it with a sense of optimism. That's important, especially these days. But also letting go of the things that weren't good in the, the past year. So it's a, psychologically it can have a, a benefit for us to be able to, to uh, put things behind us and to resolve things, hopefully, um, that, weren't, uh, that weren't resolved during, that, during the last year. So that's the, the idea of it. And I should say that I'm no expert on the uh, New Year, either in Thailand or in Sri Lanka, but I lived in, Thai in Sri Lanka for 13 and a half years and for about seven years when I was a junior monk at Ajahn Brahm's monastery in Western Australia, I attended Songkram quite a few times, so I've, I have a memory of that too, you know, and so it's, a, it's quite, quite a... It's familiar with me. It's a little bit rusty. <laughs> a little bit rusty. I always remember Ajahn Brahm for Songkram. We have it in the city centre in uh, Dhammaloka. This is the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And he'd lock up all the taps but one tap. I think it had a hose on it. <laughs> Just to make sure that it contained it a bit. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Songkram, of course, or the, is a water festival... We don't have that so much in, Ta in Sri Lanka, the, the idea of, uh, of, of, of the water festival. And it's both countries, isn't it, Thailand and Sri Lanka, really hot. I was in uh, Thailand about two weeks ago and it was very warm, <laughs> getting up to the uh, high 30s and uh, even early 40s actually. So this is a uh, water fest. Water is actually something that is very uh, appropriate at that time of year. And uh, so every year, I think everybody knows Songkran, people throw water at each other, hopefully with a good intention. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, you know, is it okay to throw water at other people? And I said, well, it depends on your intention, doesn't it? <laughs> that gets out of it. If it's coming from a good heart, mostly it's done in, is it done in? Fun, I think you know, to, uh, in a celebratory way, in fun. So that, that is what I would expect most people would be doing it. And also because it's hot, then it's, it's, a, it's a way of cooling down. So this is a, another aspect to Songkram of the water festival. And also it's a, an activity that brings us together because everybody is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that uh, brings the community together. It's, it's something that I think Thai people will recognise that uh, as, as bringing people together. And I've, I always remember from my uh, Songkrams or the water festival in Perth that Ajahn Brahm would talk about the four qualities of water and probably every Songkram, everywhere people talk about this. So it's a, and it applies, it's quite good. It's a, there are very good, um, these four qualities about the water, the quality, four qualities of water, apply physically and spiritually too. So it's, it's, it's quite a good metaphor that we can, um, that, uh, we can use when we think of this, uh, the water festival, Songkram. What does water do for us, for most people, when you get in a hot, hot weather? Cools. cools, yes, that's the idea. It cools us down physically, and that's very much appreciated, or a great relief in uh, Thailand. Even in Sri Lanka, I think people like, like the water a lot too. And of course, in the terms of the Dhamma, it's about cooling down our negative emotions, isn't it? Cooling down those strong desires, cooling down those, that angry mind states that uh, we can experience, cooling down the delusion, the sense of self, which really fuels a lot of the desire and fuels a lot of the anger as well. And, it, of course, the Dhamma is uh, also about learning to restrain, and this is uh, to these, uh, restrain these negative emotions and also to overcome to let go of them when they have arisen. That is more tough, <laughs> letting go of them. Restraining or avoiding them, this is a little bit easier. And how do we do that? 
what's the, the method we use most for anger at least is mm-hmm. metta. Did I hear metta? Yeah, or maitri. And that is one of the uh, ways we can calm down ill will and negativity in the mind. And of course, you know, other, other uh, defilements like desire and everything, we can reflect on, on the nature of desire. We can bring up the perceptions of the unattractiveness, say, of the body if it's a sexual desires and things like that. So we balance the mind. So there's lots of th- ways we can restrain the mind or let go of these negative emotions. But the good news is <laughs> the Dhamma is also about developing and maintaining a positive emotions and of course, you know, I just mentioned metta, but there's lots of other ones. Karuna, compassion, uh, joy with others' successes and their good qualities and also uh, equanimity or a sort of sense of acceptance of people as well as contentment and gratitude. And today, forgiveness too. <laughs> That's quite a, a very positive emotion and thankfulness. And when we develop these good emotions when we uh, w- and maintain them they help us avoid or restrain negative emotions because they don't get so much opportunity for those emotions to come up and so then we don't have to let go of them <laughs> so that's good news so this is the first quality of water that it cools And all of us need to cool down at various times, whether physically or mentally. And it's very, this is an aspect that water has of cooling. And this is an aspect that the Dhamma has of cooling, bringing coolness to the mind and uh, settling the mind, bringing peace to the mind, bringing happiness, inner happiness to the mind. And another quality that uh, water has is that it binds, doesn't it? It binds things together. And you know, for instance, the common example is is, uh, water and flour. It creates dough. It binds the ingredients together. And I think Ajahn Mudato may think of another uh, another (laughs) example. We're coffee. (laughs) I thought you might think cement and water. (laughs) Because... Ajahn Murato is involved with the building quite a bit. But coffee, that's good. There we are. <laughs> so so it, it binds everything together. And, of course, in, in, in a material sense, it brings a sense of community for us. Uh, it brings us together, that sense of binding together. And uh, in, in the Dhamma, of course, this translates in terms of harmony, bringing harmony to... The, to um, the, the society we live in, to our family, to the society, to the world. And this is actually something we need more of. <laughs> we need more of in our society. There tends to be, isn't there, with the internet particularly, a lot of division is growing in our society. So an emphasis on harmony is something that's really, really important for all of us. And how do we do that practically? Through our actions, of course. And the big one, speech. Speech is what can really be very, uh, can bring harmony and peace. Or it can divide us so easily. And that's where we have it on the internet. You know, it's more written, isn't it? It's more uh, than spoken on the internet. So speech is really important. Uh, Having that speech which is truthful, but not hurtful, <laughs> not using truth as a weapon. Having speech that is not harsh, but is gentle, is, is soothing, is something pleasant to hear. Having speech that brings people together, not divides people. This is, and having speech that is meaningful, rather than having a lot of the gossip <laughs> that, that uh, uh, we, we often focus on. And of course we can do all this also bring sense of harmony is gifts, isn't it? The gifts that we give. And this is an important part of New Year um, in Sri Lanka, I'm sure in Thailand too, and at the International New Year too, giving gifts that connects us. And they can be physical gifts or just gifts of 
of our time, of listening to people. There are many gifts we can give that are not material but are much uh, appreciated because these days the most um, appreciated thing is really something we can give is time, you know, and sometimes just time for family, <laughs> let alone other people and children. So, and uh, this reminds me of when I was in um, uh, Sri Lanka last week, in fact, last Wednesday, <laughs> and where I stayed, um, I stayed with a supporter who has uh, two rooms, or two have kutis on the roof of his home and a, like a shrine and garden up there. It's a bit like a heaven realm up there. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> and it overlooks a temple too, actually, and it's close to the sea. But this supporter is amazing for the... and his wife, and they, they run a, a, a company on Buddhist principles and the very good role models. It's all, all very well to run something on principle, but you have to be an example of it too. And they are, this, this uh, man and his wife, both are. And for the new year, they did, it was really so heartwarming and so inspiring. They had these two very large shopping bags full of food for each of the employees, and they have about 120 and for some of the neighbours, and uh, for some of the customers too. They call it hampers. <laughs> but they were really... I saw them, put them putting it together. It was a really... They were really good um, value, you know. There were all sorts of foodstuffs that would be very useful for people uh, for the new year. And it was really heartwarming to see. I was actually... The, uh, they were handing the bags to me, and I was handing them to the... Uh, to the, the person who was getting it. It was really weighing me down, actually. All the photos, I'm bent over. <laughs> but it was lovely to see that. And then, not only that, then they gave bonuses, sometimes big bonuses, sometimes small bonuses, to all the staff. And it was, you know, little envelopes. And they gave letters confirming, you know, new staff's permanent uh, appointment, you know, after six months, evidently. So it was really heartwarming to see that. And they did it with a very good feeling too. And so this was really something that I, I was really touched by. You know, I thought, wow, this is lovely. If you want somebody to have a good new year, it's good if you give them the physical wherewithal to have, start the new year in a good way. Food is not bad. <laughs> if people have food, that's a good way to begin the new year. And of course, you know, bonuses as well. And it really reminded me, you know, that this personal touch, you know, this human touch, so important, um, you know, when with the new year, not to just, you know, to to uh, to do it as it were by hand directly, you know, not just to send a bonus through with the paycheck, you know, bonus written on it or whatever. I was amazed too, because the envelopes I saw them, they were quite thick, and I thought, is that actually cash? He said, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants a check because <laughs> you never know. You think, well, the check's great, but will it, will it be cash it? Can you cash it? So it was really lovely to see this. Uh, for me, it was very inspiring. And I thought, gee, this is a good message for New Year, really. And interestingly enough, it does hampers for, the, for New Year, the uh, International New Year, because it tends to be the business New Year, too, in Sri Lanka. And he does that for the customers, not for the staff so much. So it's lovely, isn't it? And they're going, they get a week's holiday. And they finished, I think, uh, Wednesday evening. And then going back to their villages for a week, you know, their homes, wherever they are. So that was lovely. And they've got all those things that they can uh, start the new year in a good way. And it makes them feel like coming back. <laughs> They also, I know from that company too, that they work long hours and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, they give a lot too, so it's good. So, and as I, I often say to people, it's important when we see case, when we see situation, when we see goodness in action like this, that we make much of it, we rejoice about it. Um, because there is so much negative news we're exposed to, aren't, isn't there, for all of us, that it's very easy to lose our balance and think the world is really this dreadful place and, uh, you know, uh, we've got to be so... Um, uh, give rise to a lot of anxiety. 
but also suspicion too, you know. And when you hear the news and we, we can... I don't know about you, actually it's a good idea to turn off the notifications. If you've got, if you've got notifications for your news, turn it off, I think is a good idea. Because you'll see, you know, in minutes, terrible events around the world. And it can have an effect on the mind. Do you think it has an effect on the mind? Yeah. For sure. So we have to look after our mind. That's one of, one, of, one of the things we can do, is look after the mind. If we see it's going in a negative direction, then not to um, give, give exposure to, say, too much news. And this is uh, good for our mental well-being. But as I said, if we rejoice in seeing uh, goodness, whether it be actions of goodness or speech, then, in actual fact, in Buddhist terms, we're making good karma through the mind. So it's a very, very good way. It's also lifting the mind, giving balance to the mind. So this is something we can, uh, can do and that why thereby, you know, just see that the world is much, much more <laughs> than what the news uh, gives us because it's always these, uh, these um, amazingly negative events happening. And, of course, in terms of... Um, Harmony and uh, other quality at New Year is respect, isn't it? Whether it be in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, in, uh, in any of the countries celebrating the New Year generally, if they've got a Buddhist um, background. And of course, that's going to be uh, for the respects for uh, our teachers and our, uh, the monks, the nuns, the Sangha, and our parents and uh, elders in the community. So this is... This is something that brings harmony to, brings a sense of connection. And sometimes I know in the West people, they, they sort of feel like, you know, well, if I'm going to give someone respect, they've got to, you know, really deserve it. Otherwise, I'm not giving it. Don't, they've got to qualify. That's it. And they don't realise that the emotion, this is what uh, respect is, an emotion. And it's a beautiful emotion to have. So it's something we can encourage in ourselves. And we, the person who has the respect, gets the benefit. I, I, that's how I see it. And for instance, when people bow to monks and nuns and they bow to me and so on, I don't take it at all personally. Most of them don't know me at all. But what they're doing is bowing to the robes. But sometimes you see people, they show respect in such a good way. I think, sadhu, what a good mind state you have. That's beautiful. And it's nothing to do with me. It's the benefit is for them. So we should, I think that's a useful way of thinking of respect because we miss out otherwise because we're always going around thinking, are they worthy of it? Have they done this? Have they done that? <laughs> and in the end, it's our mind that we're looking after and we're trying to develop the positive, build up the positive and reduce the negative. And the Buddha, of course, the famous Mahamangala Sutta, he mentions that, puja cha puja nyanam etang mangalam muttamang, which is honouring those worthy of honour. So this is something that uh, will, uh, it brings happiness for us, actually, if we can bring up respect in the mind. And another thing that the water does, and uh, it's, oh, time's going, water does is, it brings growth, doesn't it? That's what water is about, especially here in Australia. <laughs> we, though we're getting, we've had floods in um, New South Wales and and all these sorts of things. But it brings regeneration, regrowth, and uh, and of course, when we're having these harvests and all this sort of thing, we're thinking of the next season that rain comes at the appropriate time for the harvest, uh, for the planting. And so this is important. And in terms of Dhamma, of course, you know, one of the, there's quite a lot of images of what water means in Dhamma. And of course, water in the forms of lakes and ponds is likened to the mind. The mind is like water. And it can be agitated, it can be um, uh, uh, by the wind, there can be mud in it, there can be plants growing over it, that sort of thing. And this is when the mind has got the negative qualities in it. And this is the, some of the similes that the Lord Buddha used for 
the five hindrances and using water as the example. But when the water is clean and pure, we can see into it right to the bottom. This is another simile that the Buddha uses. So this is, this, and this is the way our minds can be. The like this water can be agitate, agitated, have mud in it, all this sort of thing. Or if we develop the, the Buddhist path, if we develop the Noble Eightfold Path, it can have this purity and clarity. And we can really see deep. We can see, and the mind can be very peaceful and still and not have all the ripples that, uh, that are driven by the wind. And, of course, one of the big images that uh, I like, actually, in the suttas is of rain falling on the mountain and filling up the small uh, gullies and the creeks and then flowing to the rivers and then to the really big rivers and to the sea. And this is an image that the Buddha uses for cause and effect, you know, things flowing one, to the ne- one from one to the next and so on, right to the end. This process, natural process which is driving our lives. We think I, me, and myself is driving life, (laughs) this sense of self. But it's actually this sense of the flow of uh, the cycle of cause and effect. And this is one of the strong images that the Buddha uses over and over again when he's talking about the the cycle of uh, linked events being causes for the next event and then so on, next factor. So this is all related to water. And of course, the next quality of uh, of water is that it purifies or it cleanses. And this is um, very obviously, physically, what do we do with our clothes (laughs) when they become dirty or smelly? We wash them. And uh, so the water is, is very useful in purifying things and we use it a lot and uh, so this is important and in terms of the Dhamma what what would that uh, signify of course it signifies the purity we are we are developing uh, through the path the Noble Eightfold Path purity of the body uh, of our bodily actions our actions our speech and our minds and of course today you took the five precepts and uh, they are one of the ways that we develop that purity of mind, starting with the body, the actions and the speech, but then also developing the purity of the mind through developing the mind. Uh, This is bhavana, meditation, and it's also developing the mind through wisdom. That way we can purify it. And uh, the the ultimate uh, purification of the mind, what's that? you think enlightenment. enlightenment exactly exactly enlightenment that's a very pure mind combined with great wisdom understanding the nature of reality those two things it has to be the purity of the mind and this wisdom as well and also the, what purifies us is of course the give it forgiving too forgiveness is is a very big part of purifying the mind Otherwise, we carry around all this stuff in our minds that we can't forgive. And uh, we, we burden ourselves with these negative emotions. And of course, very traditionally, if for traditional Buddhists too, we ask forgiveness from the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha often. And uh, at this time, New Year, as I mentioned, our parents, our teachers, elders uh, in the community. So all these... Uh, we can ask forgiveness from. And as I mentioned, as we've mentioned before, after the uh, lunch dana, uh, we will have um, some of these uh, forgiveness through pouring water. First of all, you know, the uh, Buddha statue, for those who would like to. In in Thailand, it's a common practice. Not so common in Sri Lanka. I think people (laughs) haven't seen this, actually. Pouring water over the hands of the Buddha. And after the lunch dana, the monks and the nuns will be here and you can pour... Uh, there'll be uh, a, uh, some people doing it, but others are welcome to join in if they wish, pouring water over the hands of the monks and nuns. And this symbolises um, forgiveness, you know, letting go of all those, all those things that we've done. 
that we would like to, as it were, wash away. This is the idea. And there will, um, after that, there will also be the water sprinkling, you know, this using the, the swish here. Um, so that will also uh, be sharing the blessing. And you see the water here in these water bottles? When we, we, we did the chanting, um, this was to, as it were, to empower this water. This is quite a common idea. Um, and we've got the string around the Buddha statue too. So this was, so we'll use some of this water for the blessing when we are over there, for the sprinkling of the water and for Sri Lankan people more used to drinking the water, which is why we keep it in the bottle. <laughs> and they usually drink, put some on the palm and then drink it and then put it over their head. So this is uh, what we'll be doing later. Um, and I remember... This, this takes um, uh, the water festival even further than I've ever uh, experienced, which is in uh, northeast Thailand, when I was there in 2005 during the hot season, it was really hot. <laughs> I can say that. It was amazingly hot. And, uh, and the villagers came and uh, they wanted to bathe the monks. Isn't this an interesting idea? It was only the men... And they'd have a, they had a, like a screen around a cloth, right, basically, and this chute with water coming. And each of the monks would go into this, uh, go under the chute and get, uh, get washed. We'd have our, our lower robe on. And, and, the monk, and the men would just, you know, wash the legs and the arms and that sort of thing. And that was a whole body experience. <laughs> <laughs> that was really quite amazing. And so this is another aspect of, you know, asking forgiveness really and washing away those, uh, uh, those things that people have done or said or thought that uh, were bothering them. They also have another uh, funny, it's funny for us anyway, uh, um, a tradition in, in that village next to Wat Pa Nanachat, which is, they, at the, every year, and I think they probably do it at the new year, they bring a bucket of sand. Isn't that extraordinary? Because they figure that when they came and coming and going from the monastery, they've taken all this sand away from the monastery. So they bring a bucket of sand to, to return it to the monastery. So that was really interesting. So, as I say, in this new year is always something about, uh, as I say, taking stock of the past year and being grateful for those things. There's many things to be grateful for in the past year and, and forgiving those things that weren't so great in the past year. That's, that's our job. So we can let go of it. We can bring healing and growth and start the new year afresh. So this is the idea of forgiveness. And, of course, forgiveness is that really good emotion that allows us to do that. And I sometimes just like to mention, when I was in Sri Lanka, somebody reminded me of a talk I gave about forgiveness. I was going to talk a lot more about this, but I think probably it's uh, too long. Um, and uh, one of the amazing stories, the lived stories of forgiveness can be really quite, they're really heartwarming and they make us think, wow, if that person can forgive that, well, the things I've got to forgive <laughs> are nothing. And, of course, the story that this person reminded me of was of Eva Kaur. She and her uh, twin sister were in the concentration camps during the Second World War. They were there and they were, um, the, uh, they were the subject of medical experiments. They're being injected with various things, substances, all sorts of experiments that were pretty nasty. And uh, th so it was really uh, an incredibly negative, uh, distressing um, uh, experience for them. Their parents had been killed in the, uh, in the gas chambers. And the amazing thing with this was that in the 80s and the 90s, this Eva Kaur, she forgave the, uh, the, forgave the Nazis for what they did. And she said... The reason she, uh, the lovely, what she said is that uh, it's a great saying. She said she forgave them not because they deserved forgiving, but she deserved <laughs> forgiveness. And that's what forgiveness does for each of us. We unburden ourselves. 
uh, all of these things that we think are unforgivable, that we can't let go of. And so this is something that um, frees us. And that's what she realised. Not only did it free her, but she felt like it empowered her. Nobody could take that, that, uh, um, uh, that right away from her to forgive. That was hers. And, of course, many of the survivors of these concentration camps found that what she said was <laughs> totally unacceptable for them. But she said, this is only for myself, my view, because they couldn't let go of it, but she could. And she realised that when we carry around this, um, these uh, things we can't forgive, it's like rubbish. It's like we're, we're always sad, we're always the victim. And uh, she said she couldn't live life like that, admittedly. It took her 30 to, to 30 to 30 to 50 years to do that. But if someone can let go of such a negative experience like that, like Eva Kaur, K-O-R, surely we can let go of the hurts, let go of the disappointments, all those things that were uh, negative about the past year. So this is... When we see examples like that, it's just so encouraging. And she started a forgiveness uh, uh, website, and there are lots of stories of people who forgave things that were pretty incredible, and in the process freed themselves from those hurts and, um, uh, and also then were able to bring up much more joy, happiness and connection with other people. So this is the amazing story of Eva Kaur. If you want to see more about uh, Eva Kaur, she's uh, on YouTube. There are some of hers, uh, her uh, videos about her and it's really quite extraordinary that somebody can forgive those things. So amazing. So I'd like to end the, the talk here just by reminding, uh, uh, wrapping up <laughs> the theme of this talk, which is, you know, the four aspects of water and the, in using them to develop the Noble Eightfold Path, that sense of cooling, cooling down the negative aspects of uh, our behaviour, our actions, our um, speech and our minds, and just cooling those down and establishing the coolness, the peace of Dhamma within that uh, extinguishes these fires that the Buddha said. What do you call them? The fires of greed, hatred and delusion. So if we can cool those, wow, we're doing well. And who's cooled them fully? An arahant, an enlightened person. They've, they've fully uh, quenched them, as they say. So this is for the cooling and for the bringing together. So we promote harmony. Uh, we use our actions and our speech in a good way in, in our lives, within our families, within our community. And one of the places we need to have good speech, where is that? Within ourselves. Inner speech can be the most harsh, <laughs> isn't it, for all of us. So to have kind inner speech is very important to promote that harmony within ourselves. And, of course, water also symbolises growth, so growing these good qualities in, from the Dhamma, under, growing the good qualities in giving, in developing our um, sila, our ethical behaviour, developing our minds and developing our wisdom. And lastly, the purifying aspect of water to develop purifying the mind all the way to enlightenment, to when it's p totally pure and we have seen things as they truly are. Because when we purify the mind, the mind can settle down, it become more peaceful, it can go deeper in the meditation. If our ethical behaviour, what, what, what we say and do, is not good, when we sit in meditation, we remember it. <laughs> so it's good. These are all the uh, good qualities that we can use in developing the Noble Eightfold Path, these four qualities of water. So I'd like to finish there. And uh, so there we are. And if, if there are any comments, questions or complaints, you're welcome. <laughs> the complaints are always interesting, actually. <laughs> there we are. Uh, thank you, Ajahn, for the talk for the new year. Now come to question time. Uh, 
Uh, we will alternate the question between in the hall and online. Should we? So if you have any question, would you please raise your hand? We pass you the mic. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. That's great. Here we are. Oh, wasn't that great? Um, yeah, okay. We must start a question online. Wow. Ajahn, how can I wash away my last uh, during meditation? In recent weeks, I have experienced a reduction of my lust in day-to-day -day life, but in meditation, I still experience strong lust from time to time. Yeah, that's a, a common problem for um, for many people, you know, most people really, because lust, sexual desire, is a very strong root or in, in our minds. And it's actually one of the things that drives us through samsara. It's why monks and nuns are celibate. It's, it, that's not always easy. <laughs> because when you damn something, of course, you know, you have to do it with wisdom. And um, so this is important. So, yes, this is something that the Buddha talked about in, in some detail. You know, how do we overcome lust in the mind? And really, the lust is built on this image we have of the other person, isn't it? Of a, of a human being, our ideal of this person. And so the way we can uh, reduce that is actually by focusing on the, the unattractive qualities of the body. And if this is something that really can balance the mind. If we really look at the nature of our bodies, it's not difficult to find unattractive qualities, I can tell you that. <laughs> you know, we can see it. But we tend, when we, we have this orientation towards looking for the attractive, for the beauty, beautiful, we tend to lose that balance. And they, they, we, we tend to um, be overwhelmed then by lust. So, you know, just, at, just focusing on the, the daily things that we experience, urine, uh, defecation, sweating, the, the, the outside of the body. I know uh, Ayakima, she had a, a very interesting uh, body contemplation, which is we have the idea we have a zipper up the front and you can take the organs out <laughs> and look at them. And, uh, and think, was this kidney beautiful? No, not really. Is his kidney beautiful? Her kidney beautiful? This liver beautiful? Of course it isn't, you know. And if you, if you anyone can reflect that uh, we have the saying that the beauty is only skin deep. And if without the skin, wow, <laughs> a body is not so attractive, actually. And there used to be uh, a, um, I think he's still around, actually, a... Uh, um, a doctor who, who does uh, these, um, preserves bodies actually and does uh, anatomy sort of classes with them. But he has things like removing the skin and one of his, and he does them in a very artistic way, Gunther, Gunther von something or other. He's got quite a bit of style too. And he's got one where he's got this, this uh, body that has no skin and it's holding up the skin in one hand. <laughs> And it looks it looks pretty gruesome, but it's quite artistic too. He's very very artistic. But when we reflect on what a body would be like without skin, it's not attractive really. But I find the one of the ways we can do this without too much difficulty is if there's an image we have of someone who is beautiful in our minds, then just to add a bit of imperfection to that image. You know, just imagine that person with a, uh, with a lot of weight <laughs> or whatever we find unattractive. Ajahn Brahm has pimples. And in our minds, it's very interesting because, because what the, the image that is driving lust is in our minds. The, the Buddha calls it subanimita sometimes, subanimita. And it's this very attractive image. The reality actually is often not like that. Actually, it's not the reality. But when we add something unattractive to that image in our minds, it's quite interesting, the effect. I've done that, and that has a big effect. Because really where lust is, is in the mind. Where that supernimiter, that image of beauty is, is in the mind. And if we can as it were, just put an imperfection that will really turn us off. <laughs> you know, that's great. One of the best ones 
for for people and uh, this person is bad bread. You know, if you have a lot, a lot of sexual lust and, and then somebody breathes and you go, wow, <laughs> it, will, it, will, it will extinguish that lust pretty quick, actually. You'll be amazed how quickly it goes out the window. So there we are. There are so many things. We can just turn to the unattractive qualities, which are there in the body. It's not like you have to make them up. It's just that we have to give a little bit of attention to them. And it's not that. We focus on them so much that we get very negative because that happened at the time of the Buddha, didn't it? That the monks, he taught a suba to the monks and they all uh, were all practicing a suba and they got totally depressed and, and uh, negative. And some of them committed suicide or they got somebody else to kill them. And when the Buddha came out of retreat, he said, where are all the monks gone? Ananda. He said, well, they've killed themselves. <laughs> and so then what did the Buddha do? He taught anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath. So we don't need to overdo it. But when we can see the mind going in that direction, we know we can just turn the mind a bit to the perception of the unattractive, asuba sanya, and it will cool the mind. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is some ways that we can do it. Recognizing that largely lust, largely this image is an image in the mind. And so that way we can deal with it. I think it's very effective. So if you try it out, this person has asked the question, try it out and see, you know, just redecorating or, you know, uh, adding features, unattractive features to that image in the mind and then you know, that can reduce the lust. And so this is, the, uh, this is some of the ways we can do it, yeah. And also if we reflect on impermanence too, of those, um, those humans, those bodies that we're attracted to, I think it's wonderful now with the, um, YouTube and so on. You can see all these beautiful people, handsome, beautiful people, from when they were young right to when they died. You know, and you can see the progression and you think, well, what is there to be to attach to? They won't be like that for so long. So impermanence also has a way of cooling the, the, the perception of impermanence, has a way of cooling the mind too. We don't grab on to, the mind doesn't grab on to those images that bring up lust so much then. So thank you for that. It's a good question and it's a universal uh, um, uh, problem for all of us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Arjun, for the guidance. Yeah. Um, we have any question from the hall? Yeah. Hello, yeah. everybody. Hello. Um, my family owns a building. It was used as a yoga center for 20 years. Yeah. So it has a big hall mm. and four other rooms, also a kitchen and dining. And um, my uncle is interested in donating it for use mm. um, for the Buddhist society. Oh, right. And I was wondering whom I should speak to about that. Yeah. Um, because I think it's very exciting. No, oh, that's great. No, that sounds good. The person to <laughs> speak to is probably Adrian. Is it you, Adrian? Or do you think Chinlook? Or no, Adrian probably best at the, the preliminary. Yeah. Two persons. Two persons. President and the secretary. Oh, president and the secretary. Yes, that's it. So you could speak to. This is our president here, Adrian. Adrian T. Just if you can put your hand up, Adrian. Three Juth, yeah, so there we are. Those two, then you can start the ball rolling. So that's lovely, that's good. It's very generous and very um, very kind, actually. That sounds great, so good. All right, that's, a, that's, a, that's not really a question, but that's a lovely, <laughs> a lovely thing to do on New Year, you know, to, as, as it were, give a gift or, um, a yes, to, uh, for, for the New Year. So great. All right. Yeah, is it? That's it? Great. Ah, one, oh, one more. All right. Ajahn, I may have heard wrongly, but I'm talking yeah. about water. Yes. On water, we yeah. 
um, we are talking about using the water to uh, yeah. bathe the Buddha and use the water mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. bathe, uh, to wash the hands of the Sangha. Yes. Or maybe the Sangha will use the water to sprinkle on the yes. devotees. Some of these. Um, aren't these uh, rites and rituals? Mm -hmm. Are we to follow them? Um, or how much, you know, that kind of practice mm. we should have? And is that a right view? Right. Very good. I, th that's excellent. That's a really good question because, of course, if if we with these rites and rituals, if they don't have a, a good meaning to them, a, a, that a, that uh, that has a positive effect on the mind, um, then they uh, then they rely on superstition, don't they? Really, and they're not coming from right view, because right view would would tell us that you know that this these things. Of in and of themselves, you know, you know, splashing people with water, not right view. They are not. Um, there's no. Um, uh, uh, they're not part of cause and effect, really. But if we know that this brings a positive um, uh, effect on the mind, this is something that can be beneficial. If we understand what we're doing, if it is meaningful. Um, and uh, it and it actually inspires the mind, gives the mind more energy and joy. Then it can be useful for us. Um, it's not to encourage, of course, superstition. I agree with you, and uh, I see that quite often with a lot of the, some of the rituals we do in Buddhism, that people can take them quite the wrong way, because in reality, you know, we we develop the path by our actions by practicing the path from right view right through, not by, um, as it were, creating luck. Luck is an idea, actually, that people often have with these rituals. If I do this and I do it the right way, then I'll get that, you know. And, of course, that's not understanding karma because it's our actions of body, speech and mind that will generate... The good karma, good luck, you could call it. That's what I talked, I talked about for the Lunar New Year. Then that's in accordance with right view. That if we, if we do things that are positive through our actions of body, speech and mind, it will give rise to positive results. And if we do negative, the reverse. And so this is much more of an understanding that cuts through a, a lot of this idea that the ritual will do this for me. Uh, and do that for me. However, there's always a however, isn't there? You've heard of um, uh, um, placebos in medicine? Yeah, placebos. Sometimes if we, a placebo is uh, a medicine, it, people think it's a medicine and they take it and they get well. They get over their cancer, they get over this, they get over that. It has no medical <laughs> medical value, but what it has value is for the mind, the, the mind that believes in this is a, a medicine, and then it heals. So placebo is a, another aspect of it. It is really pointing to, and this is in Dhamma too, the power of the mind is extraordinary. Um, a very interesting study I, I read, and they found that... Uh, Sometimes uh, that uh, people who even knew that it was, uh, something was a placebo, they took it and it still worked for them. Isn't that interesting? So, and one of the big problems that uh, even a lot of the uh, drug companies are having is when they run these trials, the placebos are running almost equal to, <laughs> to the, the, the positive results from their drug. So it's really pointing out the power of the mind. So... This is something that we can be aware of. But if the power of the mind is used with something that has a, ba uh, uh, a basis in reality, that's much, much better. Um, but the, the mind is very, very powerful and can take some of these things uh, and, you know, create miracles with them, really. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. But as Buddhists... We're practicing, practicing the Noble Eightfold Path and it's coming from right view, as you said. So, And uh, it's interesting, Ajahn Chah, for instance, he didn't do a lot of these rituals, but he, he did some of them and, uh, you know, he gave meaning to them. That's the important thing. So I'd like to... That's it. Thank you for that. That's a very good question. That's excellent. Sadhu. <laughs> 
Sorry, before we end, uh, this is the last uh, ending statement. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity for the Sri Lanka New Year and the uh, Thai New Year Songkrang. Like any traditions of the New Year, uh, we'd like to uh, s s uh, pay our gratitude towards the Sangha for giving us the teaching and the guidance throughout the year. And in return, we'll like ask for forgiveness, which I'm sure there's, there will be a self, uh, uh, forgiveness uh, activities afterwards. Yes. But for those who likes to ask, for, who won't be around, they can ask for forgiveness now or later. Um, so certainly, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you um, to the monastic, to the sanghas of monks and nuns, uh, for giving us the teaching and uh, and guidance through the year. Yeah. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's good. That's great. And uh, for monks and nuns, when we, uh, when we part, we we're always asking forgiveness. We're, and we say, you know, whatever I have done through body, speech and mind, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, please forgive me. And then, usually the Sangha member, uh, customarily, they say, I forgive you, please forgive me. Because <laughs> it goes both ways, forgiveness, isn't it? It's always both ways. Cause, and it can be unintentional too the hurts that occur, sometimes intentional, but often unintentional. So there we are. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. There we are. All right. And everybody's welcome to come over, of course, for the um, the lunch dana. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, I think, a lot of uh, Thai food and Sri Lankan food. So please come over uh, as well. Terawan Saranai. There we are. Sok <laughs> Sabai. Could everyone just wait until the sun?